This is the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast, session number 355. Patty Bell Hastings on Digital Detox. Welcome to the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast with Jason Lynette, your professional resource for hypnosis training and outstanding business success. Here's your host, Jason Lynette. A quick insight before I get into the details of this week's conversation with Patty Bell Hastings. If I'm ever having a conversation with someone about the growth of their business, one of the most important questions I can ask them is what do you have more of, time or money? Because the reality is the roadmap to success is going to be different depending on these two factors. And as an example, if a person has more time than they have money, let's say they're in a startup phase and they already have another career that perhaps they'd like to phase out over time, The strategy becomes, let's maximize your time. That's where we focus on free to low cost strategies to get an organic message out there, start to put some content out on social media streams, YouTube, go out and do business networking, give live talks. That's the roadmap for someone who has more time. On the opposite side of things, if the person's in a position where they intend to scale up what they're doing, Chances are that means they are limited on time, but because things are already going well in their business and they want them to go even more well in their business, there's a little bit more money to start to invest back into the business. So I give a quick example of this. This is why I'm currently using paid traffic uh, in the shape of what I do. We're short on time, yet now, not that I intend marketing to ever be a gambling metaphor, Yet metaphorically, we can appropriately play with the house's money, and it's okay now to reinvest some of that income on things that will bring in the desired audience over time. That's the formula if time is limited and instead money is a bit more abundant. And how perfect is it that Patty Bell is on the program this week and two of her specific audiences that she speaks to? One is in the category of what she calls digital detox where we have all these incredible tools, all these incredible, you know, technological things that are intended to make our lives better. And yet, unintentionally, at least on our part, we get hooked into refreshing our email 1,014 times a day because we've now trained ourselves to believe we need to see it the moment it comes in. We put up the video on TikTok or perhaps we put up a post online and we now have become the slave to seeing how many views, how many comments is it getting. These are technological assets that are neither good nor bad. It's a matter of how do they then start to either become tools within our life and getting away from how do they begin to direct our life. So Patty Bell is going to share some incredible insights as to what she does with her clients in the category of digital detox. Now, on top of that, see, time and money, one of her other programs is called Divine Finances. Because, again, money is neither good nor bad. You hear the old phrase that money is the root of all evil. No, perhaps it's the greed of money. Perhaps instead it's the desire to track money rather than our impact in people's lives. And that's a fault that a lot of business owners, unfortunately, fall into. And instead to rebuild that relationship with money in one part, because for the most part, our societies don't train us as well as they could, yet how it's not always about the strategies and tactics. Very often, it's about the emotions. It's about the stories that we're already telling ourselves. And Patty Bell is going to share some incredible insights in this conversation about what exactly it means to step into a lifestyle of divine finances. One of my favorite moments of this conversation is the fact that we begin with a rather personal story of getting involved with personal change methods to create a massive life transformation at a rather young age. And this sort of renaissance lifestyle of not only becoming a phenomenal hypnotist and having programs that are clearly impacting people's lives, yeah, on top of that, she's also a tenured professor. Got quite a bit of things going on. So clearly she is using her own programs (laughs) in terms of digital detox and divine finances and walking the talk in terms of what she shares. I would encourage you to check out the show notes of this episode. This is episode number 355. So simply head over to worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash 355. That's where you can find the show notes specific to this episode and check out 
the book that Patty has written, check out the challenges and the groups that she's running, which we'll do our best to put all of those resources there on that show notes page. And plus, I'd mention too, I think we have a first with this episode. In nearly eight years of episodes and 350 plus in this series, I believe Patty Bell is the first to share the story of doing crowdsourced fundraising to launch a business project. Something that as soon as I saw that she was doing this a couple of months ago before I invited her on the program, already I started to brainstorm when, where, and how can I do that? Because it suddenly brings you in front of an audience. And one of my favorite messages is that it takes what you offer out of a product and into a movement. And that is, I I have to say it, not that it should be trending. That is one of the most trending things right now in 21st century messaging. So there's a lot to unpack, a lot to unravel. So be sure to check out the show notes at worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash 355 to get in contact with Patty Bell and find out more of what she's offering. And while you're there too, we have some phenomenal events coming around the corner. Work Smart Hypnosis Live and Online is our live online, in real time, certification training. However, you're not going to be asked to sit in front of a computer for 100 hours and listen to a bunch of lectures. This is a unique approach to hypnotic training that's a hybrid style of education, where it's one part interacting with the digital materials and then meeting together in real time with a community of hypnotists all around the world to sharpen your skills. Now, part of the audience are folks that might be like you, that are entirely brand new and are looking for reliable tactics to help people to produce positive change. Now, because this is not a class that's just teaching you how to read people's scripts once their eyes are closed or locking you into rigid protocols once the hypnosis begins, the other half of our audience classically are people who are frustrated with where they are right now in hypnosis. They're not yet confident becoming flexible in their work. They're not yet confident working creatively based on what the client has shared. Or perhaps they're just not getting the results that they want. And I don't intend to speak with the royal we, uh, because when I do this event online, I often bring in a guest instructor. And once again, by popular demand, Richard Nongard is joining me once more. Check out all the details at WorkSmartHypnosisLive.com. And I'd be uh, amiss by not mentioning the fact that Patty Bell Hastings is also a member of our Hypnotic Business Systems community, and she gives some insights in this conversation around success she's had in her business, thanks to some of the things that she's learned by being a part of this community. Look, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's no need to struggle in the starting up or scaling up of your business. Hypnoticbusinesssystems.com, check that page out. It gives you proven, reliable systems that you can plug into your business right away. My goal is to help you make this happen faster and easier, which is why in the last year, we've added some really cool content because now there are done for you marketing materials that you have my full permission to reproduce, put your name on it, change the title, you know, customize it to yourself. But this is what I found to be the fastest and easiest way to get you up and running sooner. Simply put, using the systems that I teach, booking one or two new clients, you will easily recoup your investment. Now, clearly, the goal isn't to stop there, then keep using it, and now you've got the systems to grow time and time again. So check that out at hypnoticbusinesssystems.com. And here we go. This is session number 355. By the way, as a quick preview, uh, two people in my programs have joined together in their own two little person uh, mastermind. And uh, Patty Castellanos is actually the guest next week on the program. So you're going to hear the two of them talk each other as a small preview here. Here we go. This time for real. Episode number 355, Patty Bell Hastings on Digital Detox. I was introduced to hypnosis 30 years ago through the Silva method. Yeah which at the time was called Silva Mind Control. And I had already been meditating for about 10 years at that point. And the Silva method really made that goal oriented. Yeah. And I found that it transformed my thinking and got me to a level of mind management that makes it possible for me to do pretty much 
anything I pursue. Nice, nice. And there's a lot to already begin to unravel inside of that. So for those that are not familiar with the Silva method, could you give like the sort of the Cliff Notes version as to what that entails? So the Silva method is actually a series of hypnosis audios. I'm going to call it hypnosis because I really believe that's what it is that walks you through from the original just countdown relaxation, getting to that deeper level of trance or hypnotic state, whatever people want to call that. I'm not really attached to, to names and labels. And then through a series of using those methods to make internal changes and some really great ones like you know, having a council of mentors mm -hmm. and, you know, using the mirror method of, you know, imagining futures and time experiences. It's really thorough. Yeah. Now you said having some breakthroughs as a result of that, anything specific that you can share? Oh, absolutely. I have experienced enormous success as an artist and a designer, Fulbright scholar, I owned a vacation home in another country for a decade. I am a tenured full professor. I've, I've experienced unbelievable success. Now, if you can kind of pinpoint what it was from that training, what it was from that program that helped to facilitate that, how would you kind of encapsulate that? Like, what is it you're able to either see or do differently as a result? I am able to control my thinking. Yeah. Is there a way you could describe how it was before versus what it is now? Um, how it was before. So I would rewind back to when I was a teenager. I was a drug addict and alcoholic. I got clean and sober when I was 20. That's 1981. And I also got on a meditational path, which really set me in this direction. So I went from being like complete mess hell bent on dying or something, right? To phenomenal success. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. So that journey from, you know, from the Silva method, at what point did the hypnosis start to introduce? And I agree with you in terms of these are all, to use Richard Nongard's term, these are all category words with various styles inside of it. And at the end of the day, we're all basically saying the same thing just with different titles and different dressing. Uh, at what point would you say it kind of became a little bit more formal in terms of hypnosis? In terms of me facilitating hypnosis? Let's say either being introduced to hypnotic concepts or you know, beginning that journey of starting to learn it formally as hypnosis. Well, I think you know, once I experienced the Silva method, then I found out about NLP and self-hypnosis and sought out, you know, different recordings. You know, this goes back to when things were on cassette tapes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sought out recordings and experiences. This is pre-internet. So whatever experiences I could. So to me, it's it was an amalgam yeah. of hypnosis, meditation, NLP. So I would say that... I started to formally pursue hypnosis and various forms of hypnotic therapies for myself after experiencing enormous trauma, saving my daughter's life during seizures. Yeah. So then you mentioned tenured professor. Tell us part of that story. So... <laughs> I never, I never meant to be one of those, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> I did not set out to do that. But during the first Persian Gulf War, I ended up taking on a class, a computer design class that the local school, art school, could not find anyone to teach. And I fell in love with it. It was gratifying in a way that making stuff is not, you know, working with other people and seeing the light go on and helping them reach their creative fulfillment yeah, and career. That was awesome. So then along that journey, then where did that become formal in terms of now teaching? 
That became, uh, well, I kept teaching. I kept taking classes, you know, agreeing to teach classes. And then I started um, pursuing full-time teaching in my late 30s, I believe it was. Yeah, my late 30s, mid to late 30s. And I just got such deep gratification. I, I think of myself as a facilitator, Jason. I facilitate transformation. And in terms of the being the professor, I facilitate 18-year-old students to the transition of becoming 22-year-old professional UX, UI designers. Yeah. So, and then, so in my hypnosis practice, I'm still a facilitator. I'm primarily facilitating through hypnotic methods so that the people that come to me can access deeper levels of mind to reach their intrinsic motivation and foster internal realizations and changes. I love that. I love that description. And what's great about that, you know, we often get into the story here as to what got you started, what that connection is. And what's fascinating is when we hear that story that here's what I did before and here's how I'm continuing that. And here's the through line from one to the other that I'm hearing part of your sort of internal dialogue is that it's the same process. It's the same outcome. It's the same journey, just different, let's say, roadmaps to get there. Yeah. Different methods, practices, and modalities. Yeah. So how would you say that's informed the hypnosis work that you now do? Um, that line is really much clearer for me because I became, I was voted into a position of leadership and in academia. <laughs> <laughs> I know that laugh. <laughs> Let's just say department chair is like the, you know, worst position of leadership <laughs> you, mm. could, <laughs> you could be voted into. And I realized that I really, I had no leadership training background. So I started pursuing it like hot pursuit of whatever leadership training I could get. And I was really lucky to fall into somatic and embodied practices and worked with some great groups out of Boston and other places to learn how to take that embodiment the somatic practices into a place of leadership so I could support my people in compassionate and helpful ways. And through that process, you know, I started to realize that the body really has a deep wisdom that it's trying to communicate to us all the time. And most, you know, mo many of us are ignoring it or tuning it out. And the hypnotic practices are also really embodied. You know, there's all kinds of phenomena, embodied phenomena or somatic practices that we use in the hypnosis process. So it just seems like a, a real connection. Although I, I have an incredibly eclectic background. The other piece of the leadership training that has led me along this road was being introduced to Marshall Rosenberg's compassionate communication. Oh, wow. Yes. Or nonviolent communication. So I started training and practicing in that about 10 years ago. And while I was using it for my relationships and my leadership, when I started incorporating it into my hypnosis practice, I was able to facilitate some massive changes and breakthroughs because I really believe that certain methods of hypnosis are really getting at the underlying needs beneath the feelings. Could you explain that? Yes. So in compassionate communication, it's about developing a language for feelings and needs, understanding what our needs are, and changing the strategies for meeting those needs. So for instance, if I'm working with a client who either has a technology addiction or one of my divine finances that's either experiencing overspending or underspending or 
money avoidance entirely, getting underneath the feelings, the uncomfortable feelings that are causing them to binge or overspend to the needs that are underlying that, then we can create strategies to meet those needs that are healthy, that are no longer dysfunctional. Does that make sense? That that does make sense. And you know, I always tend to say that this is why, and I'm I'm gonna reach a different conclusion based on the same thing that you just said. This is part of where I lean heavily on hypnotic phenomenon because at the end of the day, your client feels their problem and it's kinesthetic. That's what's informing them that something needs to change. Even if it's something that's a mental dialogue around anxiety or even a lack of focus, because they can feel that, it means that we should use a process of hypno hypnosis where they can feel that something is occurring. And you know, my solution to that is hypnotic phenomenon. I'm curious to hear some of the specifics as to how you address that. So from the somatic and embodied background, I was trained in a couple of different methods, one out of Kripalu, the fabulous yoga center in Massachusetts um, by one of my trainers, Ken Nelson, fabulous, fabulous transformational workshop coach. And then after learning that method, I came across Eugene Gendron's focusing, which is another method of also very hypnotic, taking someone into the body. So in the methods I use, I take people into the body to find out where the feeling is. It And the kinesthetic part may be sensing texture pattern, heat, cool, you know, discovering what it is around those feelings. And then having a communication, which is like parts therapy, right? Having a communication with that area of the body. Yeah. So looking at, and again, we can throw a bunch of other techniques into a similar conversation, whether it's parts, whether yeah. it's a six step reframe, which is basically parts, uh, just with different dressing to it. But I love that in terms of you know, looking at what's the feeling and then exploring that and then finding a better way to satisfy that. Is, is there a story that kind of stands out of working with a client where this was part of the approach? One of my divine finances clients came in completely avoidant of even looking at the finances, like afraid to look. I facilitated a journey within to find out you know, where those feelings were, what sort of memories or events or experiences came through that, and the underlying need, right? The need that the avoidance was trying to fulfill. So she went from completely not looking at money to, I don't know, within two sessions, she'd set up Mint, <laughs> was checking <laughs> yeah. her money every day. <laughs> you know, was putting borders and boundaries around her clients where they were just running, you know, roughshod over her. I'm trying to remember back to the time frame that I was inside of BNI, Business Networking International, and we had like a professional organizer in the group. And there was this dialogue around, you know, she'd get up every week and give the 45 second pitch around, you know, the areas of our home that become cluttered. And like one of the taglines that I still remember to this day, this is 10 years later, is um, if you ignore if you ignore that mess in your garage, it's not going to go away. It's just going to get bigger. So the next time you see that, call me. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned you mentioned divine finance. Can you explore? Can you expand upon what that is? Yes. So I I started my own money healing journey in 2018 um, when I was going through a divorce. And uh, found a fabulous financial therapist and money coach by the name of Barry Tesler, who has a year long money school called The Art of Money, and dove headfirst into that. It's a very somatic, embodied experience and method that she delivers through that process and all of my studies in hypnosis and hypnosis techniques that I was doing at the time. I realized that it's, it's a hard area for people to face. People don't want to talk about money. 
there's so much shame and blame around money. Even some of the big money gurus are very shamey, blamey. And going through this in a massive group and going through it myself, I identified ways that hypnosis could go in and help someone make breakthroughs where they were stuck. So I started offering it and the transformation in people has been phenomenal and it's compassionate. You know, I, the tagline for divine finances is casting light into the shadows of money work. Mm. <laughs> That's good. But having somebody, you know, I feel like, you know, the facilitator again, I'm going to say it again, you know, having someone just be on that journey with you, a compassionate, non-judgmental person to help guide you within, to uncover your blocks, your uncomfortable emotions, and your realizations and breakthroughs. It's just transformation at the best. This this brings about an interesting principle in terms of marketing and communication that, you know, there's two different types of offers we can make. One is the improvement offer, which is just, hey, here's something you're already doing. I'll show you how to do it better. And, and the better opportunity is that of something that's the new opportunity. And that's what divine finance fits into the category of. What, what's beautiful about when it becomes a service, though, is that it's improving the uh, new opportunity. So to, uh, as you said, to be there actually guiding them through the process, to have another set of eyes to uncover the blocks that normally we would either miss or um, consciously choose to ignore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, the, the game of, I've, I've, I've had clients in that category over the years and it's the, uh, well, there's that pile of envelopes that I'm terrified to open. What are yeah. what are some of those sticking points that these people you're working with, what are some of the catalysts that become the reason why they seek you out and then find you? My creative field, there's lots of money issues. We've got cultural, you know, baggage around artists don't make money or creative people don't make money or, you know, so I, I have a lot of creative people come to me. They see my success. So they believe that there's something that I might be able to help with them with in the same way. Mm -hmm. Are there things that you're doing to let that story be known? I'm getting ready to, I'm going to start offering a group experience coming January, 2022, so that people can get a taste of it and a flavor of it. The one-on-one -on -one practice is available through my website. But I really want to have a group practice so that it can be available to more people and it can get out there to more people because most of us, our parents did not teach us much about money. Here in the US, the culture around money is really messed up. Yes. <laughs> you know, so we pick up all of this baggage that we don't even know we're carrying, you know, and all it takes is someone else, you know, to like, help point out some of the beliefs or premises that we can just let go of and move on from. Yeah, which it's one of those categories that has, you know, such huge benefits beyond it that suddenly now the person is sleeping better because they have a sense of peace of mind that now they know things are taken care of, even for that person who may not necessarily have, let's say, the savings or the retirement right now that they would like to have, to have at least the plan in place and know that they're on track, know that they're on course to make that happen. And we hear so many stories, even in this country, as to here comes the unexplained, unplanned medical event and how it turns into, sadly, a moment of you know bankruptcy. Exactly. What are some of the breakthroughs that people are having? Like you mentioned some of the blocks that they would have. What are So I have clients who never dreamed that they could have investment accounts that have investment accounts. Yeah. I have others that have emergency funds for the first time. You know, everybody has different issues. Like I have some that are now investing in cryptocurrencies. So it's, I say it's as individual as a fingerprint. Yes. And I have, through my training from you and my primary hypnosis trainer, Mark Beal, I have very 
detailed intake processes so that I can really get a full view of the individual that is coming into the practice. That, that's really insightful in terms of looking at how we can gather the information. There's a very quick story that I'm clearly going to leave a ton of details out of for obvious reasons, <laughs> um, but it's friends who own a Mercedes bus and the bus wouldn't start. And here's the moment that I had my Kia Forte, I think is the name of the car, rental car, which rents in Las Vegas, I think for $8 a day, which respectfully is basically Tupperware on wheels. And <laughs> there we were using jumper cables to start the bus from the you know little tiny, basically plastic car. And I'm taking a photo of this as I'm being told, you can never share this photo. And I, I'm in that moment thinking this problem is just as real to them as it is the person who can't afford the new car, but the car is too old, but still needs a transmission. And it's that financial crisis as to, I don't have the six or seven grand to get, you know, just a basic used car, but I kind of do have the 1500 to repair the transmission, but this is going to create that financial loop that what you said is, is great there that for some people on different levels, it might just be having that extra couple of thousand dollars in the case of an emergency. And for that person who does have the extra money to throw around into a slightly risky investment, that's just as genuine to that person as it is the person dealing with that, that car trouble. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think we are here in the U.S., I want to, because I know you have an international audience we grow up in a culture that trains us in scarcity. So we have millionaires who feel like nothing is ever enough. So helping or facilitating someone to a point where they feel enough, they feel like they are enough, that they have enough, they can be enough, that's hugely powerful. That's, that's amazing. You mentioned another service that you provide, and I love the name of this, and I love the concept of it. Tell us about Digital Detox. <laughs> digital Detox. Well, this really, really ties into my professorial <laughs> gig. No, wait, let me, let me give the right transition. So now that they're staring at their cryptocurrency, which trades every <laughs> single day of the week, rather than just basically um, you know 930 in the morning to four o'clock, like the standard stock exchange, how are you then getting them off the computer? <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't laugh because that is a real that, issue. That I, 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 I've made fun of that one publicly as someone who, to quote Richard Cole, I heard him years ago. He was on this podcast several times and he talked about a turning point in his business that he goes, I used to ignore the numbers and then quote his words, I discovered that I could become horny for the numbers. <laughs> I could then track what was working, what wasn't working, and then move forward. And I can call it out if I'm given streaming numbers that change every second. Dear God, I need to turn that off. So when here came the opportunity when I'm like, oh, wait, mutual funds, automatically every month, this month, this amount of money goes in, and it doesn't change other than once a day. That's what I need. <laughs> Automation. Yes. Set it and forget it. Set it and forget it. <laughs> yes. Where did I learn that from? Hmm. Um, <laughs> the, so the digital detox came out of my, I teach UI UX designers, but I teach them ethically, right? Because there have been too many situations where 20 year olds have designed things like the Facebook like button that have hijacked people's minds, right? So that, you know, ethical interface design is an ethical interface design patterns is something that I teach as a professor, but I also began to realize over the past couple of, I was going to say decades, yes, past couple of decades, that we were becoming more and more attached to screens. And this digital detox is really a mission I am on for humanity. I am on a mission to redirect our dopamine seeking habits because that's what we're doing, whether, whether it's checking our email a hundred times a day or binging on Netflix 
or checking our likes, whatever those, whatever those activities are, we're dopamine seeking. We are getting pleasure or we are getting rewards, chemical rewards in our body for those activities. And I have developed a protocol to help shift those habits and activities to practices that move us forward rather than having us look at the screen. And that is incorporating hypnosis into the process of addiction recovery. Yeah, which I love that that framing of it. So then integrating hypnosis into this, share some of the insights as to what's being addressed, what strategies are being introduced. Basically, and this this goes for pretty much everything that I do in terms of my hypnosis offerings. First, is I establish positive resource states. Positive resource states. So that's the first step. And tying that to a vision of the future, right? Why are we doing this? Why are we giving this up? What is it that we want to be different? What are we not doing that we wish we were doing? Or what are we not doing that we say we don't have time for? Because we've accidentally just lost an hour scrolling on Instagram. Yeah. I really believe that great innovations and breakthroughs, books, works of art, fabulous movies, whatever uh, businesses even, great innovations and breakthroughs come through states of focus and flow. And that we can't innovate or create those amazing things that we are capable of creating if our attention and time are chopped up into ever smaller increments. Right. And especially that, you know, when we figure out that the distraction pattern doesn't work, the I'm going to have everything open all at once. And this moment, I go back to my first professional session that I ever did once I moved to Virginia. And while not exactly digital, uh, it fits into the same category. He's a life insurance agent sits down and I just politely ask, hey, do you want to take out that uh, Bluetooth and um, put it over there next to your phone? And the response was, no, I can't take this out. This is the um, you know life of my business. And somewhere came the question, and I now call this epiphany seating, uh, to give it a fancy name, <laughs> which would be, I wonder if the fact that you feel so married to the business and you're terrified to take that thing out for just 45 minutes here is part of why we need to be here addressing this other goal of yours. And he sits yes, there, pause for a moment. Yeah, and he, and he takes it out and he puts it down. <laughs> 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 and also the, well, the awareness too. And this is a dialogue that I have to get into sometimes with people. And my, my secret weapon personally may be that I am a morning person and I do have like a 30 minute chunk in the morning while I'm still waking up that I respond to emails uh, that assistant has put into a folder for me to then review, by the way. And, and the secret, though, is in both Gmail and Microsoft Office, I can schedule those emails out to go out at a reasonable hour. So it doesn't look like I'm responding at 5, 12 in the morning. <laughs> right. Schedules for like 9.35 a.m. So it's not training people that I'm available every single moment. Right. I mean, there's so many ways that we can modify our interaction with these things. And that is also unique. You know, one of the things that I espouse is conscious moderation, because those of us running businesses, we can't just remove ourselves. We can't just go off grid. We have to interact. But to be able to design, purposefully design our interactions so that we can go in and do what we need to do with, without getting ensnared is really critical. So now here's a question which kind of looks at it from that 30,000 foot view in terms of program design, in terms of creating something. What's that balance for you, would you say, between this percentage, which is dealing with the mindset, dealing with the emotional patterns, dealing with the somatic methods, versus the percentage that with you know time management concerning digital materials or even tracking our finances, the other percentage clearly would be something in the category of tactics. 
How do you divide that split? I would say that that is unique to each person, but ultimately it goes back to the compassionate communication, the feelings and needs. My belief is that humans are just trying to get their needs met. <laughs> We're just trying to meet our needs. That was a nice little that was a nice little meaning of life moment right there. <laughs> <laughs> we are just trying to meet our needs and our feelings are indicators of whether those needs are not being met, you know, and the strategies that we are attempting to meet those needs are giving us information. So for some people, it's going to need to be more hypnotic state. We're going to have to go in and, you know, really kind of do some rewiring where some other people who have better control of their thoughts and understanding and language for their feelings and needs, those people might be better served by tactics. So it's a spectrum. Well, I'd say that's the important thing of what you already brought up, the thorough intake to recognize where people are. And I think you've heard this story, which I'll make brief here. I don't know if I've ever actually told it on the podcast, but it does go back to and the sort of mission statement of this quick anecdote is calibrate to the person you're talking to and figure out exactly what they need and then serve that. Uh, this goes all the way back to prior to episode number one of this podcast, which was launched in conjunction with some online programs. And I had never done that before. So I called up someone in another space, another industry to say, could I hire you as a consultant and just have you tell me what software you use? Let me pay you for your time. And he dipped into some weird coaching mode to go, yeah, but what's been holding you back? Why haven't you done this yet? Like I thought of it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I realized that I already have video content that can be organized into a product that I think can help people. And rather than do my own research, I'd rather just pay you for your time and you tell me what software is to invest in. Yeah, but what's been holding you back? Nothing. I just thought of it yesterday. And, and this is our routine for like 20 minutes. And I find a polite way to exit the call. Paid someone else 150 bucks who goes, oh, easy. Do this, do this, do this, and do that. You should also think about this. I'm like, thank you. And end of the story has a nice ending. I don't have to censor it here. It's six months later, I run into this other person at a conference and he just pulls me aside to go, I was such an a-hole that day. I am so sorry. I'm like, I tell the story now in my trainings, <laughs> recognize where someone is because it might be, this is where just as a simple example of this with the sleep improvement client and take this for what it's worth, use what already is working for you if that's the case. But if I ask the question, have you ever looked into what they call sleep hygiene? If they say no, I say it might be worth Googling it to see what that is. And I leave it at that. If they say yes, and I ask, how did that go for you? And I hear they've done everything and that wasn't the thing that was going to be the solution. They didn't need tactics. They needed something to quiet the mind. They needed something to calm down the anxiety. They needed something to address the emotional stuff. I never bring up sleep hygiene again because they've now just ratified the tactics were not what they needed. They needed something more on the personal side of things. So I love that your answer was that of getting into the tactics. So the, the question is, is everyone you work with uh, in the finance or in the um, digital detox category, do you see other issues or what's kind of the shape of your business these days? I see lots of other issues. I've even done fear of flying. I have a lot of people that come to me for relational issues, either love relationships or family relationships. And this is also where the compassionate communication piece really shifts and changes things. Everything from, you know, a young woman that was going to fly to another country to uh, meet with a father she was estranged from, to people who come to me for past life regression therapy or between lives regression therapy because they have tried everything else to resolve certain issues in this life. They've been to therapy, they've been to this, they've done that, they've, you know, and they want to try this to see if they can finally get the shift that they're looking for. So really habit issues, I've seen a wide array of also, spiritual journey people, people who want to 
take an inner journey to meet with their higher selves or, you know, again, I'm not attached to any language or labels around these things, but facilitating inner journeys is a very common thing that people come to me for. I love that. You mentioned launching a group. You mentioned some of the other ways that people find out about what you do. How is that you find that most clients, most people are discovering you and then eventually becoming your clients? What, what's working in terms of the business these days? Right now, it's word of mouth. Yeah. But through your fabulous guidance, I am instituting and doing all kinds of other things now. I just finished a seven-day digital detox challenge through a Facebook group called the Conscious Moderation Club. Nice. <laughs> I love and that. And that has attracted some new people into my sphere. In addition to that, I'm writing the book through Richard Nongard's fabulous 12-week book class, if anybody needs to hear that or know about that. I'm writing the digital detox book, the seven step process. I'm writing that book, which will be out in January. And I've also got a group course workshop for digital detox that'll launch in January as well, the first week of January, so that people can kick off the new year and reclaim their time and attention. I love that. Yeah. So, so I'm using social media. Um, I've actually got a fabulous assistant right now who is helping me with Facebook ads and targeting. And I'm running a couple of ads for the digital detox book. I'm doing some fundraising around that. I'm basically doing everything that I'm learning in your fabulous groups and courses. Oh, thank you. I want to, you mentioned fundraising. I, I, I know the details of this and I want to hear, I think this is the first time ever on the podcast, someone has talked about fundraising as a strategy to grow their business. Can, can you expand on that? This is the advantage of having an eclectic background and an innovation mindset. When I started writing the seven-step digital detox workbook, I was doing the research that Richard had us doing in the course. I was also researching through some other writers, publishers, authors, I've been published in traditional publishing in the past. And I was like, geez, how do you, how do you kind of get the word out about this? You know, if you're self-publishing, if you're indie publishing, that kind of thing. And I was like, oh, I'll run an Indiegogo campaign. Mm -hmm. I'll <laughs> run a fundraiser. And, you know, if it works, fantastic. If it doesn't, it's going to be an amazing learning process which it has, and it has been getting the word out, and it has been getting some notice, and I have been getting support through that campaign, which is also how I came to run the seven-day challenge. So yeah, so it's unusual. <laughs> I think I'm the first person in Richard's class to ever do this. Yeah. But what it's doing is it's also pre-marketing the book. Right, yeah. So it's, it's through social media and word of mouth and supporters, the information about the process and the book is getting out there in advance of the book being complete. What, what's beautiful about all these strategies is that, you know, we talk about the three steps of um, sales. It's always audience engagement, invitation, no matter what we're doing, those three steps are always there. And what's great about what you've been sharing here is finding an opportunity and doing something about it, to say it quite simply, rather than, well, I put up a website and I'm waiting for someone to find me. It's through events, whether it's a challenge or events like the Indiegogo campaign or utilizing whatever channels you already have. Uh, that's great. And this gives a really cool model of some truly innovative ways uh, to be found. Where can people track you down? How can they best get in contact with you? Well, if they are interested in my hypnosis services, my website is soulshepherd.love. And you can also find me on YouTube under Soul Shepherd Hypnosis. 
my leadership coaching and facilitation practices are run out of mindfulmarks.com. And you can also find Mindful Marks on YouTube. If you're interested in the digital detox, then if you go to tinyurl.com, reclaim your time, you will find out all about the workbook, the hypnosis audios, and the campaign that I'm running. Excellent. Uh, thank, thank you so much for coming on this program and sharing a lot of ideas that honestly, I've been over here taking some notes going, I got to do that. That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> any, any final thoughts for the listeners out there? Um, final thoughts. Um, can I give three? Absolutely. Okay. One, make mistakes. Michael Jordan has some famous quotes about how he is successful, not because of the baskets he made, but of the shots he missed. So make mistakes and learn from them and move on. We have a saying in the design world, fail fast, fail forward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's my first one. My second one is eat your own dog food or cat food for the cat people out there. Please tell me this is a metaphor. <laughs> it is a metaphor. Okay, good, good. <laughs> it means do the self-hypnosis, get your own hypnotist, get your own coach, right? Have the same support that you offer other people. And then my last one is whatever you're doing, whatever you're pursuing, get an accountability buddy or five, you know, create a support network to help you succeed. Those are my parting shots. Jason Lynette here once again. And as always, thank you so much for leaving your reviews online, interacting with this program, interacting with our phenomenal guests, and using this as an ongoing resource in our profession. So join our public Work Smart community. Check out Work Smart Hypnosis Live. Check out Hypnotic Business System. Simply put, head over to the show notes at worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash 355. That's where you can find all the links to connect with Patty Bell, all the links in terms of what's going on in the Work Smart Hypnosis universe. And we'll see you all very soon. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the Work Smart Hypnosis podcast at worksmarthypnosis.com. Hey there, it's Jason, and I want you to be one of the first to find out as we upload amazing new content. So do this right now. Click the subscribe button right here on this video. That's going to link you to our YouTube channel here, and you will be the first to find out as new resources and downloads are made available. Do it now.